Hi, I'm Anish, and I'm a solutions architect here at Amazon Web Services, specializing in data and analytics. With me here today is Du Dong from DataSpark, and we've invited Du to the session to share the journey on how they overcame the challenge of cost and latency in their massive data pipeline and analytics implementation. And we're so glad to have you joining us today for the AWS Singapore Online Summit. In this particular session, we would like to share more on what AWS has to offer to its customers in the area of big data processing and how DataSpark built highly cost-optimized data strategies to process hundreds of terabytes of data as part of the geospatial mobility intelligence offering. But to get started, let's look at some of the most common challenges in dealing with big data. First, the traditional way of processing big data tightly couples storage and compute. Now, what this means is if you have a need to increase the storage or the compute capacity independently, now that is very hard to achieve. If the infrastructure used for big data processing is always on, then it can lead to a lot of inefficiencies. It's like leaving a light switch on at home 24 bar 7, even during the night when you don't actually need it. The next challenge is on catering to the need of the users to perform self-service analytics. Now, if you do not have the tools that the users want to work with, available as part of the infrastructure that has been set up, then it becomes really hard to democratize data within the organization. Next, traditional big data deployments are extremely static and cannot scale during increased demand. Now, this requires you to procure hardware based on the maximum use, which in turn leads to a lot of unused capacity during non-peak workloads. Now, this is also relatable to the always-on point previously mentioned. The next challenge is around upgrading the production environments with the latest version of open source frameworks such as Spark and Hadoop. It's really hard to introduce newer versions into the deployment clusters without disrupting the existing workloads. It's one of the main reasons a lot of customers I work with are still on very old versions of these frameworks and are really afraid of upgrades even when they know that the newer versions will provide a ton of benefits. Lastly, adding new resources into the cluster can have really long and slow deployment cycles. It could take anywhere between weeks to months to scale the size of your cluster, where you have to manually procure new hardware and add it into the existing infrastructure. But to solve these challenges, AWS added EMR as a managed service into its analytics portfolio of services. Now, EMR is an enterprise-grade Spark and Hadoop managed service, which removes the overhead involved in setting up of Hadoop and Spark clusters, installing the required applications, and monitoring those applications for operational stability and efficiencies. With EMR, developers can focus on building more efficient data processing workloads instead of worrying about the infrastructure that supports them. So where does EMR fit into the AWS analytics portfolio? Now, AWS offers the broadest set of databases and analytics services for customers to deploy their analytics workloads to the cloud. Now, EMR sits alongside these services and integrates with a lot of them to provide an opportunity to simplify complex architectures. For example, EMR integrates with database uh, such as DynamoDB, Redshift Data Warehouse, uh, with S3, which is often used as a primary storage for your big data workloads. EMR also integrates with AWS Glue Data Catalog and Lake Formation to provide a layer of governance and security over the data sets stored on S3. It also integrates with real-time stream buffers, such as Kinesis Data Streams and Managed Streaming for Kafka to support your real-time analytics requirements. Now, depending on your specific workload requirements, we can easily put together a fit-for-purpose analytics architecture benefiting from the native integrations supported by EMR. Now, let's go a bit more in detail on the primary benefits of using EMR for your data processing and analytics workloads. First, EMR provides the ability to separate storage from compute. What that means is you can store all your data in S3 and use the compute capacity of EC2 that is part of your EMR cluster you then have the ability to scale either storage or compute independent of each other. Now, with the storage of the data sets in S3, you will benefit from the 11 nines of durability that S3 provides. What it essentially means is that you don't have to store multiple copies of the data like you would in HDFS, as S3 automatically stores several copies of your data across different data centers to provide that level of durability. For persistent clusters that runs 24 bar 7, you can make use of auto-scaling. During peak workload hours, when you have strict SLAs to meet, you can scale up your cluster and go back to base capacity during off-peak hours. Also, from the separation of storage and compute, you can run transient clusters, which are essentially clusters that spin up to run a workload and shut down immediately after the job completes. Now, EMR packages 22 different tools and frameworks. 
This improves the self-service capabilities wherein users can choose from a wide range of tooling to build their analytics workloads. As covered previously, EMR integrates with a lot of other services on AWS and makes it easy to build decoupled data pipeline architectures. In the past one year or so, we've improved the Spark runtime environment quite significantly. For example, if you're running Spark on one of the older versions of EMR, you can get up to 2.5 times performance improvements by just upgrading to the latest version of EMR that has the new developed Spark runtime environment. Finally, with Spot instances, you can save anywhere between 50 to 90% of the cost on the compute nodes that are part of your cluster. With the EMR instance fleets option, you specify target capacities for on-demand instances and Spot instances within each fleet. Now, when the cluster launches, EMR provisions instances until the targets are fulfilled. Spot instances are a great way to reduce the time it takes to complete all your workloads on time by adding more resources into the cluster while saving costs. So with that background on EMR, I would like to invite you over to share more on their experience of using EMR running Spark workloads and also with using Spot instances. Now, Dew heads the engineering practice at Data Spark and leads a team of brilliant engineers who have always been a delight to work with. Over to you, Dew. Hi, my name is Dewey Deng. I head of product engineering for Data Spark. And today I'd like to share with you some of our experience and learnings using Spark Computing. Um, and this is a very highly cost effective tool on the AWS buffet table. Data Spark itself uh, ingests various data sources, including telco and transport data. We map the daily movement of data into major transport arteries. Our algorithm generates various mobility elements, such as uh, trajectory, state points, velocity, and out of this, we calculate origination, destination information, which translate into trips, and the trips themselves compose of various elements, such as transport links themselves. The uh, primary usage scenario that we focus on is transport planning, um, out of home advertising, and event crowd monitoring. Now, we have access to telco data in various geographies, including Singapore, Australia, Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia. Our solutions run on-prem or on the cloud, and the uh, population data ranges anywhere between 5 million and 250 million users. Um, in today's example, I'm going to focus specifically on our Australian data set, which is a small slash mid-sized data set. This is a visualization of how we map our mobile cell signals into the major transport arteries of Singapore. Um, the tall columns represent uh, population density around very specific cell towers, while the lines represent the mapping of our links information into the transport arteries themselves. This particular visualization is about how we use the mobile signals to monitor traffic density on the road systems in Sydney. In this particular example, on this day, a protester climbed the harbor bridge and forced massive closures uh, to the bridge and the surrounding traffic pattern spread itself across Sydney. You could see the traffic comparison between 9 uh, a.m., which is on the left side, and uh, the highly dense red lines. And on the right-hand side is the 5 p.m., where the traffic itself had pretty dispersed to the surrounding neighborhoods and everything has cleared up. In this scenario, we leverage our location segmentation information to help with uh, out-of-home advertising locations. The idea is we blend our geospatial data with various other data sets to figure out the demographic and segmentation information for various user densities at specific geolocations at different times of day. This helps with the ads inventory planning for these specific areas, which could include things like uh, billboards, e-boards, um, bus shelters. This is a high-level view of our data as a service infrastructure on AWS in Australia. Um, there are three main silos in our data pipeline where we extensively apply spot computing. During normal operations, about half of our infrastructure cost is on the data serving silo. So our approach here is using a combination of spot and presto. And in the data management layer is where we apply most of the Spot and Spark uh, approach to this layer, although some of the stuff we are moving also to Spot and Presto. Now, the data analytics silo is the core of our data science capability. The massive algorithm requirements in this layer can typically explode the cost up to 3 to 5x. A previous exercise that we did in 2018 burned a hole in our cloud budget this pretty much prompted us to investigate 
better and more cost-effective ways to implement our pipeline using spot computing. Now, the bulk of our data pipeline is batch processing, although some elements are real-time. Our daily batch pipeline handles the mobility information for the entire continent of Australia with about 20 million users. Now, typically it takes about 18 hours to process 24 hours worth of data. Um, here we have a typical cluster configuration, which is about 16 R4 or 4X largest. In the beginning of the period, we initially ingest about 100 gigs of data, but throughout the various stages, we end up generating about 750 gigs plus of data through you know, all the different processing. Our tech stack is primarily Spark, Scala, Java for the algorithm processing, although some elements are actually done via HPC, high performance computing, using C and MPI. As mentioned, reprocessing historical data is the main motivator for us to investigate spot computing. Throughout the year, several scenarios occur which require us to reprocess our massive data set. These scenarios include various improvements to our algorithms, uh, taking in additional data sources to enhance our mobility intelligence, and deriving new intelligence based on the improvements in the new data sources. Our historical data set contains over 700 days of information for Australia and growing every day. Remember, it takes about 18 hours to process one day of data. Now, not everything can be done in parallel due to some sequential dependencies of our algorithm. And we really have to process everything in a very short window of time due to some commercial requirements. So in a situation, we need a very large number of machines for a very short window. So purchasing our eyes is actually not an option. And using OD, remember it burned a hole in our budget back in 2018? Now, spot compute can substantially reduce EC2 costs. For example, a typical R4 or 4X large costs about $1.25 per hour, but we can set a spot budget for about 30 cents an hour. That's a massive saving. The Spot Advisor page lists the different instance types and their availability interruption frequency. Since our Spark jobs are long running, we want to minimize the spot interruption, which requires reprocessing restarts. So we select the uh, instance types that has less than 5% frequency of interruptions. Now, in general, you want to balance your budget with the, the various processing requirements of your workloads to minimize the, the amount of interruption that you experience. The thing about Spot is that a service interruption can occur anytime, and only a two-minute notification is uh, not enough for us to back up our massive data set. So we had to redesign our Spark jobs to enable gracefully restart processing after an interrupt event. Our large data set can be in an unknown state, so we have to restart at a reasonable checkpoint. The farther the checkpoints are apart, the more we have to reprocess, which ends up costing more. Our approach involves a couple of elements. One is breaking the process chain to smaller steps. This minimizes the reprocessing costs. We put the mass node on our eyes for the Spark cluster so that we don't lose the primary node's uh, processing state. We put all the work in nodes on spot fleets since the local EVS data is fairly transient. And we try to minimize the S3 access to only the beginning and the ending stages of the processing chain. So more on spot fleet next. Some more details on our spot EMR cluster configurations. We put the master node on the RI instances, and we put the worker nodes on spot fleet. Now, the spot fleet itself composed of mixed instance types of similar compute and memory sizes and spread across different availability zones. Having instances in different availability zones minimize the interruption frequency. Since we break the jobs into smaller stages, we minimize the amount of reprocessing that has to be done since we have a smaller data set on that's persistent on the master node, so recovery is much faster. Due to our long-running jobs, we experience spot interruptions quite frequently. Now, the interrupt frequencies may be less for you if you have shorter running jobs, but breaking the processing chain to smaller chunks become even more important. To, you know, to minimize the amount of interruptions. But even with all of these interruptions, our setup has enabled us to save over 40% on our EC2 compute costs. But know that this is not an overall reflection of your infrastructure cost savings. 
uh, we do plan to achieve quite a bit more cost savings with further initiatives to adjust our pipeline and algorithms. We see that Spot works very well for Spark and HPC compute workloads, so why not use Spot for everything? Here are some of the things we have in mind uh, for that's currently in implementation and planned for the rest of this year. We are implementing a Spot resource manager to orchestrate pools of Spot fleets consisting of various instance types and different compute profiles. This will enable us to have faster and more flexible on-demand compute provisioning. We're also enabling more granular restart checkpoints for our various compute workloads. Um, this is potentially possible by incremental data replication from our spot EBSs into a centralized cache uh, using something like Eluxio. Um, we're also looking at using Eluxio to improve on the data you know, access from the S3 instances that handle the, the large data sets. Now, some examples of our spot usage scenarios uh, include uh, the various ad hoc uh, algorithm clusters, the project clusters, some of the, our on-demand query analysis clusters. A lot of our data profiling enrichment, uh, data management tooling is also can be done using uh, the Spot uh, Spark cluster uh, configurations. Um, also, our various environments like dev, testing, and training can also be spun up on Spot. A little bit more about the Spot Resource Manager. The key thing here is to pre-allocate the Spot fleets that enables you to have very fast and flexible on-demand provisioning of compute resources. Short running clusters can be quickly ramped down and put back into the compute pool and then reprovision for other workloads. Um, different types of um, instances can also be provisioned for the various Spark, HPC, or even GPU workloads. And our, our orchestration automation will be leveraged via various technologies like Terraform, Kubernetes, Docker, and all integrate into our airflow pipeline. Remember I mentioned that half of our infrastructure cost during normal operation is in the data serving uh, layer? Um, we leverage Spot and Presto to enable us to flexibly scale this particular silo. As you can see, there are different types of clusters uh, that serve different uh, query scenarios you know, using Presto, and we can very dynamically spin these up. The other part is you can see that the compute is completely decoupled from the storage layer, which typically need to accommodate about you know, 250 terabytes of data. Having the separation enables us to scale up both compute and storage independently depending on our various dynamic changing needs. Here is a scenario where we leverage Spot Compute for our HPC algorithms. We currently use the uh, HPC cluster to do transport calculations for the entire state of Australia. But we plan to expand this approach to more of our algorithms, uh, especially the heavy machine learning implementation we use in our environment. We initially use the EMR setup for our HPC clusters, where we replace Yarn with Slurm, we use NFS for distributed file access, and we use the OpenMBI for distributed computation between master and worker nodes. The newer configurations we're going to leverage, again, Terraform, Kubernetes, and Dockers, and potentially for the using GPU fleets. In summary, Spot can have a tremendous impact on compute savings. A couple of key takeaways to better leverage Spot includes break your processing chain into smaller stages to accommodate more granular recovery and re minimize reprocessing costs. Um, your clusters definitely can be a mix, a hybrid mix of different RIs and Spot fleet. Um, you use variable instance types of similar to sizes in this mix and you want to distribute them across different availability zones to minimize interrupts. And where necessary, you can use RI and ODs for your master nodes. Thank you for being a part of this sharing session. Uh, more to come in the future on our learnings. That brings us to the end of this session. Thanks a lot for attending. And we'd love to hear your feedback, so please do take some time to complete the survey. Thanks again.